Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, HVAC System Design, sponsored by Aegis. I'm your moderator, Amara Rosges, with Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology. For the best online experience, here are some tips. If you're having trouble with your slides or the sound, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume settings by adjusting the volume on your own computer. If you are having technical problems, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need help, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will respond in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for the presenters in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. You may ask questions at any time during the presentation, and the Q&A portion will start in about 45 minutes. If you're on Twitter, tweet your questions to us at hashtag HVAC System Design. Today's webcast is being recorded, and you'll receive an email with a link to the archive in about a week. To download the presentation slides, use event resources on the left side of your screen. If you're interested in receiving one AIA CES approved learning unit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window. So if you want to take the exam after we're all done, I suggest you open a new tab right now because the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the archived version of this webcast. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System Policy, please take some time to read the quality assurance slide. Thank you. Here's a list of the learning objectives. We'll touch on these in today's presentation. Please note that any red underlined text you see is a hyperlink to a reference or resource to guide you to more information. Now we'll hear from this topic's sponsor. At the conclusion of the commercial, you may experience a few seconds of silence to make up for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. By allowing motors to operate at less than full speed, VFDs can save 30% or more in energy costs. But VFDs can also damage motor bearings. Without shaft grounding, VFD-induced voltages can discharge through motor bearings causing damage such as pitting, frosting, and fluting. And unplanned motor failure in as little as three months. Revolutionary new Aegis bearing protection rings provide proven long-term protection against VFD-induced bearing damage. By channeling harmful shaft currents away from bearings and safely to ground, Aegis rings ensure that motors last for the L10 life of their bearings. To protect motors from bearing damage, prevent process downtime, and secure VFD energy savings, specify Aegis rings. All right, thank you, Aegis. Let me now introduce today's speakers. Jason Gerke is a mechanical engineer with Grace, which is based out of Milwaukee. Jason has about 20 years of mechanical design, commissioning, and project management experience. He has designed mechanical systems for a variety of projects, including industrial, commercial, education, and resort entertainment facilities. April Woods is a vice president at WSP USA based out of Orlando, Florida. April has played a key role in engineering mechanical solutions for major healthcare projects over the past decade. Her passion since the beginning of her career at WSP USA has been on sustainable design. She was a 2012 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 Award winner. 
both Jason and April, are on the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. It's my pleasure to work with two of the most knowledgeable HVAC experts in the industry. Jason, you're our first presenter. You're live now. Thank you, Amara. Good day, everyone. I'm very excited to talk to you today about HVAC system design. Our broad range of attendees requires us to go through some basic steps before we dive too deep into selecting and designing HVAC systems. The first step in this process will be to talk about different HVAC system options for buildings, of course. The most straightforward system is air-based. This is typically achieved using packaged rooftop units. This would be equipment with packaged direct expansion cooling, uh, condensers, supply fan, and a heating medium of electric or gas. Other more sophisticated packaged rooftop units might have steam or hot water, as well as chilled water options. Another basic air-based equipment option is fan coils or furnaces with air-cooled condensing units. These systems at their smallest size might be what you have in your house, and the units go up to a few tons to serve retail spaces or office spaces. Fan coils typically max out at about 1,500 CFM before they are called air handling units, but that's nomenclature that varies by manufacturer, region of the country, and an engineer that you're talking to. Typically, this changeover is around the three to four ton mark. The next system that we're going to talk about very briefly is water-based systems. These are typically referenced as hydronic systems. These systems might be hot water baseboard heat, in-floor radiant heating, or in-floor radiant cooling systems, ceiling radiant cooling systems, or chill beams. These, full, these uh, systems are fully water-based. Of course, the next option is a combination of these systems when an air handling unit with hot water and chill water coils is combined with a chiller and boiler plant. The hydronic system may also serve perimeter heat or VAV box reheat. The final basic HVAC system that we will discuss today is a refrigerant-based system. These systems are typically uh, might be referred to as VRF, refrigerant uh, variable refrigerant flow. Uh, sometimes we hear VRV, uh, which is variable refrigerant volume, but that's specific nomenclature to a manufacturer's branding. These systems use refrigerant as the medium to exchange energy in the system and heat or cool the air at multiple terminal units. These systems are divided into three types on the VRF side, whether they're cooling only, heat pump, meaning heating or cooling mode, or heat recovery, where indoor units can be in heating and other units can be in cooling mode simultaneously. Next, we're going to talk about what I consider kind of a fun topic abbreviations. We're engineers, we like to rattle off these things while we're talking to clients, talking to other engineers, uh, whoever we're talking to. Sometimes it's not on purpose and someone looks at us sideways trying to figure out what we're saying. Uh, sometimes we do it, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. Mostly to save ourselves from saying the words. If we had to say cubic feet per minute every time we said an airflow volume, that would sound kind of funny. So just to make sure that there's a, a base uh, baseline created for the people on the phone today, on the webinar today, just wanted to go through some very basic ones. So CFM, cubic feet per minute, EER, energy efficiency rate ratio, SEER, seasonal energy efficiency ratio, BTU, British thermal unit, and then other ones such as IPLV, NPLV, AFUE, lots of other uh, abbreviations exist out there and we need to make sure that when we're talking to people we are using the uh, we're explaining what these abbreviations mean. Next we're going to talk about some basics of selecting HVAC systems. There's a number of parameters that come into play here. Selecting an HVAC system really requires a process. This process is different for each engineer based on their experience and project types that you might be designing. Factors that affect the system selection include code requirements, such as is there an energy code that is pointing towards a specific system type in order to be code compliant for this specific building, uh, you know, a very, very specific situation. Is an owner or their facility staff experienced with a specific system type, i.e. Uh, indoor air handling units or packaged rooftop units? Are there processes in the building that require specific environmental conditions, such as high or low humidity or very tight temperature control? All of these things will affect the process of selecting an HVAC system. 
An excellent resource to walk through the steps of selecting an appropriate HVAC system can be found in the ASHRAE handbooks. These handbooks include major titles such as HVAC systems and equipment, which discusses various systems and equipment and describes attributes and differences between these systems. Another applicable ASHRAE handbook is HVAC applications. This handbook will help engineers design equipment systems and includes a range of topics from occupant comfort to energy to building operation. At this time, April will talk to us a little bit about geography. All right, thank you very much, Jason. Good afternoon, everybody. So as Jason had mentioned, there's a lot of different reasons that we select different types of systems within our buildings, um, you know, being code requirements and owner requirements. But another big one has to do with the geography of where the project is located. Um, first of all, obviously your climatic conditions can really uh, change from region to region, um, as we can all think about, you know, even just across the country, how different our different regions um, play into how our equipment can perform. That may depend and change what type of equipment that we decide to utilize for a project. You can also think about that from a worldwide view. Um, different places around the world may require different types of equipment. Um, also, there could be local experience or equipment availability that will drive what type of system that you may want to use. Again, different parts of the country, there's different equipment that is more readily available. Um, if you're kind of maybe out in the middle of nowhere, it might be um, more difficult to get certain equipment to different areas of the country or even different parts of the world. And so that is why that could be a factor. Here on the screen is um, a view of the U.S. And this is um, a map that is very typically used um, in the HVAC world. You actually find this in the IECC. Um, which is the code that we're going to talk about later on. And this shows how the U.S. divides in terms of the different climate regions. So um, Pacific Northwest, you see, you know, the marine. Um, you see the dry over the western part of the country and then moist as you go east and then the warm, humid line um, as you go south. Um, I'm very sensitive to this because I live here now in Florida where we, it is very hot and it is very humid and how we design HVAC systems is even different than when I was in Dallas um, where I started my career. And it is also very different than, um, than where Jason's from um, in Wisconsin. So um, it, is, it does play a very big factor in not only your equipment selection but also the capacity requirements that you will have um, within your system. Next, Jason's going to talk to us a little bit about sustainability. Thank you, April. Another factor in HVAC system selection uh, and design is sustainability. We've all heard about LEED certified buildings, whether simply certified or all the way to platinum. Sustainability should be important to all of us for no other reason than to simply not be wasteful. Sustainability is affected by code requirements. Um, i.e. how do you prove ventilation air volumes for a naturally ventilated building, things can get very complicated when you go out to the bleeding edge of uh, design uh, techniques on projects. Or energy efficiency, even if you're not out to create a sustainable design, the leading edge energy codes, such as the latest adopted versions of IECC, um, will force the building to be designed to use less energy today than it did just a few years ago. So technically, you're already being sustainable just by following the code. Sometimes owners are keen on sustainability. We've worked with clients that require certain energy and water targets. Both items are greatly affected by the HVAC system selection and design. Uh, finally, it's important to point out that designing a sustainable, sustainable building does not always mean a more expensive building. Uh, an example of this is specifying a user-friendly DDC system, one that allows a user to easily set up trends for temperature, energy, or schedule and make adjustments to those items with a few clicks of a button. A DDC system does not need to be sophisticated, uh, and the most basic system can be a great starting point for a new building owner. Another example of uh, a task that should be considered when you're looking at sustainable options is performing commissioning on a new building. Performance of a commissioning contract with a scope that includes design reviews and functional equipment testing at a minimum will result in energy savings on day one. It also provides uh, some level of insurance that the building is ready for use. 
when occupancy is finally achieved by the contractor. Another important knowledge tidbit that we're going to discuss today is to know what's the difference between a code and a standard. So we all hear things, this is a code, this is a standard, what do we really need to follow? Well, a code is something that is required by, by law to be followed. It's a set of rules adopted by law relating to how buildings should be designed and built. Examples of codes are the International Code Council series of codes, such as the IBC, the International Building Code, IMC, International Mechanical Code, or IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code. As far as standards go, a standard is considered a technical set of definitions or guidelines for engineers to follow. That's my adapted uh, definition of it. Uh, standards are not adopted by law, uh, so they're not a requirement. But engineers must be aware that standards sometimes set the minimum standard of care on a project, i.e., what would another engineer in the same situation do uh, as far as decisions on designing or accepting certain things on a project. Examples of standards are those created by NFPA, ASTM, ISO, or design standards set by organizations such as FM Global or other insurance carriers. So now that we understand the difference between codes and standards, we're talking about direct application of codes. Many municipalities and states have adopted the ICC codes. These codes include specific, um, specifically the IECC that I, that I mentioned. Uh, this code focuses on energy use of buildings from the envelope to the HVAC systems to lighting and control of these systems. It's important to note that ICC codes are updated every three years, with the latest version being 2018. ASHRAE also publishes a standard called 90.1, the full name of that, which is rarely used but should be stated more often, Energy Standard for Buildings Except Low-Rise Residential. For the majority, uh, for the majority of us, we don't need to remember this long name. It can mostly assume uh, ASHRAE 90.1 is applicable to most of what uh, for most of what we do. It's important to note that 90.1 is a guideline, and that's updated uh, every three years, with the latest version being 2019. Uh, 90.1 is written in a way to allow portions of it to be adopted as code, and that's a, a newer thing that ASHRAE has been doing over the past few years. Uh, other codes to be aware of relate to sustainability. Um, as we previously discussed, these goals are sometimes achieved using uh, rating systems produced by organization, organizations uh, such as LEED, Green Globes, or Living Building Challenge. These codes and goals must be aligned with client requirements, whether, a client, whether it's a client's wish list or an owner's project requirements, each thing will affect the other. So just in general, building codes that everybody should be aware of, I've mentioned some of these, IBC, IECC, IFC is International Fire Code, IMC, um, the uh, International Green Construction Code, that's a code that's starting to become a little bit more popular in some parts of the country. The final thing to talk about on codes is following them along a prescriptive path or meeting performance requirements in codes. To understand the difference uh, is very important. A prescriptive path on applying, or complying with a code means that you're following things that are written down in a chart and written words throughout a code document. Following a performance path, methods to do that typically include creating an energy model to prove that your building, unique and not able to comply with the prescriptive code requirements such as a lot of glass or other uh, typically, uh, my experience is facade attributes that cannot comply directly with the prescriptive code. Um, and using this energy modeling process to prove uh, through calculations that the building will use no more energy than the base building. And next, April will talk to us a little bit more about code adoption. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jason. So here um, on the screen is a map of the U.S. You can actually um, find this in the link um, to the adoption of the ICC. So it might seem like you would just choose the most current code or the most current version year to use for your project. 
um, so this being the ICC 2018. But unfortunately, every jurisdiction adopts codes at different rates. Um, it would be more idealistic if that was not the case, um, but local and state authorities get to determine when and which codes are adopted um, for your particular jurisdiction. So I think this, uh, this chart does a great job of showing how different states are currently um, in the process of adopting the ICC 2018. Um, so as you can see, it really varies between being enacted statewide all the way to being adoption considered or no known consideration at this time. Um, so this is very important to do this code research at the beginning of your project, especially if you're doing projects that are outside of your state or you're doing projects kind of all around the country at various times. Just keep in mind that there can be different adoptions at different times. Very similarly, you'll see this with um, 90.1 as well. So this also shows how different the codes are, different 90.1 is um, across our country. And again, you might think, oh, I'm going to design to the latest energy standard, which for the most part, that's okay if you want to be above and beyond minimum prescriptive requirements. But it does show that there are states that are way behind in terms of their adoption of the energy code. So it, it is a little startling to me, as it may be as well to you, that of how many states are still using 90.1 2010 or previous editions um, that are really almost up to a decade old. So this just shows how different it can be um, within different states. We had a lot of questions um, come in prior to the webcast specific to healthcare, so I just wanted to address that um, briefly since that is my specialty. Um, there are a lot of specific codes that can be for different types of buildings, healthcare being one of them. Um, and very similarly, um, we have some very healthcare specific codes that we are required to follow. Um, the main one being FGI, Facility Guidelines Institute, um, that has been adopted almost um, all the way across the state, although there are some states that use their own um, guidelines instead of FGI. Similarly, uh, they have different versions that are currently have been adopted that we design around. And this is very important um, because this can really dictate and change how an architect might be designing um, their hospital just based off of whichever latest version of FGI that they are currently under. All right, I'm going to toss it back over to Jason, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about air-cooled equipment. Thank you. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation a couple different system types, basic system types, such as air-based systems, water-based systems, or refrigerant-based systems, and we're going to talk just a little bit more about those at this point to lead us into uh, some more detailed conversation after this. So package rooftop units. These are units that can serve everything from a small retail space to a large office or a manufacturing building. They're very versatile and can be applied to almost any application, unless there's very, some very special uh, requirements. Generally, these units are considered uh, lowest cost um, and least efficient, but still able to meet minimum energy code requirements. Uh, the next system is VRF systems. So these systems are very adaptable. They're able to be used for a variety of uh, building types, including anything from offices to historic building applications, apartments, or retail. These systems typically max out in a single system capacity of 60 to 70 tons, uh, but multiple systems can be designed to serve whatever the building size might be. These systems are typically very efficient and can help with lowering the energy use intensity, or EUI, of a building. Other air-cooled equipment includes uh, air-cooled condensing units. These are units with a compressor and a condenser fan, usually coupled with a fan coil unit or furnace. Sometimes they're coupled with an indoor or outdoor air handling unit, larger sizes. And then the final thing is condensing units. And I just wanted to mention condensing units because sometimes Condensing units and air-cooled condensing units are uh, used interchangeably. Not many of us um, are in situations where we're using split condensers, like if you had a split condenser from a, a chiller package or something like that that might be water-cooled or, or different uses. So it's just important to make sure that when we're talking about an air-cooled condenser, you're very clear that that's what you're talking about. And if you're talking about just a condensing unit, 
that has a remote heat rejection location that um, that that's what you mean. This terminology becomes very important as we're talking to both other engineers and owners and architects as we're designing buildings. Our next topic for today is to touch on HVAC controls. This is a very important part of HVAC system design and is incorporated in the design and uh, documented through the specifications on projects. Uh, to make all these systems work, a series of sensors are required throughout the building, so that's to make the control system work as well as make the HVAC system work. Uh, these sensors will measure everything from airflow, water flow, temperature, humidity, pressure. Uh, these sensors work uh, together in order to form the input to uh, a control system, whether it's a DDC-based system or PLC-based system. The system may be re referenced to a DDC, as I said, or a direct digital control system. Options for these systems include an out-of-the-box offering uh, from a variety of manufacturers. These systems do not allow for really any customization and are fairly simplistic in nature. There's also a lower cost associated with those systems. Other options for DDC systems allow some basic programming which will increase the cost of the project, whether it's the first cost or technician cost to do this programming. And finally, there are options out there for fully customized DDC controls or a PLC-based control system that can control the most complicated sequences of operations that any engineer can possibly dream of. So when you're going that route, it's you're trying to come up with an extremely sophisticated control system that's required based on the use of the building. Finally, HVAC controls, um, well, I'm sorry, let, let, me, let me talk about local controls first. So local controls are, very, are a very simplistic solution. Those could be as simple as a thermostat on the wall that's directly controlling a furnace or a terminal heater or, or a fan. Uh, these controls are important to understand our projects that not everything needs to be tied to the DDC system that's controlling the whole building, sometimes this terminal equipment isn't important enough or it's not worth the cost to tie these into the overarching DDC system. And then other systems that are out there. So HVAC controls, whether they're DDC or PLC, have the ability to incorporate data collection and uh, take direction from other building systems. So it could be controlling lighting, power meters, uh, as far as data collection with power meters or water meters, and also control other non-HVAC equipment, such as process pumps. DDC systems and PLC systems are able to integrate this equipment into a single user interface, which is important to allow for easy, mon easy uh, monitoring and control of these systems. It's very important that um, the opportunity is taken on a project to pull things back into a single user interface because we all know the facility engineer never has enough time. Our next topic is to just talk through some basic air handling units. So a basic air handling unit includes a few distinct pieces. The first being the mixed air section. This is the area where outside air and return air are mixed. The next part is filtration a very hot topic today. The next section could be a cooling coil or heating coil and then a supply fan. The units may have coils arranged in a particular order to achieve specific environmental conditions or fit inside a building or um, a variety of different reasons, but nonetheless these are typically modular, modular units with some ability to swap out pieces. The air handling units may use a variety of sources for heating and cooling medium. This could be anything from steam to water to refrigerants. And then finally, the hot topic of today, not necessarily of this webinar, but of the world that we live in, and that's filtration. So ASHRAE provides a minimum recommendation in the HVAC systems and equipment handbook uh, for filtration. This guide states that the minimum filter efficiency for a um, commercial building is MERV 6. I don't know that many projects that engineers are designing where you have a MERV 6 filter, but nonetheless, that's what ASHRAE says you should start with. And efficiencies in a typical commercial building could range up to MERV 13, 
or higher. And I think that's getting a lot of priority today, which is great. I would encourage all of you to uh, reference the ASHRAE handbook for filtration recommendations. In addition to the handbooks, ASHRAE has come out with specific recommendations to guide engineers and building owners through a process of evaluating filtration systems, um, specifically to address the current COVID pandemic. Air handling units can also include numerous other parts and pieces that April will discuss for us next. Thank you, Jason. Yes, yeah, so there are other components that we see within air handling units that could be either code driven or um, are based off of your building type or an owner preference. Um, and so, as Jason explained on the last slide, uh, slide, every single air handling unit does have three basic components. They have fans, they have filters, and they have coils. Um, but you also might see economizers or energy recovery, which could be dictated um, due to the energy code. So economizers is taking advantage of your outside environment during um, the good climatic times of the year. Um, so when the weather is great outside, you might be bringing in more of that fresh air into your building um, where you don't have to utilize your uh, chilled water coils as, as often. And energy recovery is taking advantage of the air that is coming out of your building and being able to use that energy in a heat transfer process um, to also minimize the amount of um, energy that you need to use. Um, humidification could be required in your facility, um, especially if you're in drier parts of the state or you have minimum humidity ranges that you're required to meet either by code or by owner preference or by a standard. Um, and now another hot topic that's coming in in addition to filtration, as, as Jason had mentioned, was the use of UV light. Um, so UV lights and um, HEPA filtration and all of those items are, are things we have been designing really for decades in healthcare facilities, um, but they are becoming very re relevant, relevant in today's um, time with the pandemic and um, is something that is being considered in a lot of different buildings. Um, also, you might come across some sort of like subcooling coils if you need to do a, a special type of process or if you're required to meet a certain type of temperature and humidity within your space, um, which we see a lot in hospitals and pharmacy designs. All right, next, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about water-cooled equipment. We have had um, some questions already come in um, um, on the uh, questionnaire here. Um, so thank you for your live questions that you're giving us at this time. And um, there were some questions just regarding two-pipe and four-pipe systems. Um, so great intro to that. Uh, so, as uh, Jason had mentioned, um, you can have a lot of different air-cooled type of equipment. Um, you obviously can produce chilled water with an, an air-cooled chiller system, um, but oftentimes um, chilled water is produced um, also through water-cooled equipment, which usually includes chillers, cooling towers, pumps, and then your air handling unit coils out in the system, which are hydronic. Now, this type of equipment is typically specified in buildings that are 24-7 facilities or ones that have simultaneous heating and cooling requirements. Um, usually you'll see this in big campus systems, like so for like a university, for example, um, or a healthcare system where you are having to run your chilled water or your heating water um, at most times of the year. So that is where you'll see this because they are more energy efficient. However, they are a lot more complicated and more complex from a control standpoint, and there are a lot higher upfront costs. So here's a quick chart of where you might use air-cooled versus water-cooled. Again, it goes back to owner's preferences, the budget that you would have for the project, and potentially your type of building. So while an air-cooled system does have a lower initial cost, it does have typically a higher energy penalty. And that might be okay depending on your life cycle cost analysis that you would perform for the owner or your return on investment. Um, but typically on buildings where we are really concerned about the total amount of energy, again, maybe a facility that has to run 24 hours a day, the energy cost does become very relevant to the owner. Now, in an air cool system, you likely will 
um, need less indoor spatial needs, so you could save some money there. Um, typically, the controls are less complex, although in an air-cooled system, you can still have very complicated controls. And sometimes, or many times, the maintenance can also be less. However, the equipment life is typically a little longer for water-cooled equipment, and your system resiliency could be more. A lot of times, if you're already investing so much into a water-cooled system, you will see an increased resiliency and redundancy placed within the system just due to the sensitivity of the system itself. So very quickly, I just wanted to go over a standard chiller cycle that you would see. So typically, your liquid, which is usually a water source, would enter your cooler where it is chilled by the liquid refrigerant that's evaporating at a lower temperature. And as this refrigerant vaporizes, it's drawn into the compressor where it increases the pressure and temperature of the gas so it may be condensed at the higher temperature in the condenser. And at this point, the condenser is really rejecting that heat from the water. And a lot of times, or typically in a water cool system, it will be actually rejecting it to a cooling tower. And basically, that is how the whole cycle interact with the cooling load as the heat from the building comes in. Now there are several different types of chillers and chiller ranges that you could see when you go out to a site or when you're specifying a new system. Um, as you can see, uh, this is a little uh, graph that shows the different ranges of tonnage that you would find each different type of chiller. Um, and it goes from reciprocating, scroll, screw, to centrifugal. And so depending on the total tonnage of your plant and what your goals are in terms of redundancy and quantity of equipment, which have a lot of different factors, you might select a different type of chiller just based off of those requirements. Something also that's important to note that honestly is a webinar in itself is different pumping arrangements. And I just wanted to bring light to this because there are a lot, of, a lot of different pumping arrangements that you would see within a chilled water system. Um, you could see a constant primary system, a primary secondary, a variable primary, and there are a couple other configurations out there that continue to exceed energy requirements. But this is just a couple of them just to show, give you a little preview of some different arrangements. Now the installed costs all vary. Um, as does the energy cost. So as we get go down on the chart, you'll see that your energy costs become less and less. And that is because as you are able to vary the flow in the system, you're able to reduce on your pumping energy. It's also important to note that you're valving out in the system so where the load is occurring at the air handling units can vary and will vary between two-way and three-way valves. This is important to note just as you are doing potentially renovation projects where you're potentially adding air handling units into a system to be cognizant of how the different pumping arrangements um, can vary between um, these different system types. In most new designs, we are designing them to be variable primary, unless you're connecting into an existing system or campus loop, um, just because that is becoming the most efficient way to do that, and also it's good from an initial installed cost. As I had mentioned, there's a lot of different types of buildings. You would see water-cooled specified over air-cooled. Uh, you might see it in a really large commercial building or even a, in a campus distribution, like a, a large um, university setting. Um, definitely, you'll see it in healthcare applications. Most hospitals do use water-cooled over air-cooled, unless it's a smaller hospital. Um, you would see it very often in labs and sometimes in data centers. And it's mostly buildings, like I mentioned, that have 24-7 operations where the payback is very quick due to the efficiency of the system. You'll see them in buildings that have high sustainability goals. And a lot of times it also has larger budgets. Um, because it's not the most cost-effective initial cost, um, that sometimes can stray away from the use of water-cooled systems. It's also no important to note that with your heating systems, on a water-cooled system, they're often also paired with hydronic heating. So where an air-cooled system may or may not have electric heat, as Jason mentioned, that you could have electric or hydronic, most of the time you see water-cooled systems with hydronic heating. There are some few cases where you might see electric, but in most parts of the country, you would see a hydronic heating system paired. 
Now, this can be a lot of different ways that you make your heating water source. It could be through steam to heating water heat exchangers, hydronic boilers, or even some sort of energy recovery. Buildings that demand simultaneous heating and cooling often are, are um, water-cooled type systems. One strategy that you could also look at um, is thinking about using potentially a heat recovery chiller. So heat pump chillers are a very effective way to take um, the water, take what you are going to then um, discharge into atmosphere um, through the use of your cooling tower and actually bring that back into your heating water system. So this is an example of a hospital heating water system where you would have boilers and chillers, but you would take some of that load through a heat pump chiller and you would actually reject that heat in back into the heating water system and use it as free energy. And that is a very effective way to save some on your energy costs. As I mentioned, there were a couple questions that came in while we were building this presentation regarding healthcare and lab specifics that I just wanted to touch on briefly. First of all, um, most of, in most of these types of buildings, you will have minimum air changes in all the rooms 24-7. So 8,760 hours of the year, we have to meet certain air changes. And again, that is why it is a good driver to use a water cooled system as your type of system choice. Um, we have high-level filtration that's already needed, um, so there will be places where we will do um, mostly MERV 14 filters, but also up to HEPA filtration in really specific areas. Typically, you're seeing fully ducted air side systems, so that is supply, return, and exhaust, and you want to isolate your contaminated exhaust systems. Um, obviously, we've been doing this for decades, isolating contaminated exhaust, but it is becoming more and more re re relevant as we're dealing with the current pandemic. Uh, we also have very stringent temperature and humidity ranges and have to maintain certain pressurization requirements as well. There are special airflow patterns that happen throughout the hospital and also through laboratories that have to be specially considered. So one project I wanted to introduce um, that I did that uses some of these components is Emory University Hospital J-Wing Expansion that was done in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it was completed in 2018. It's a project that I'm um, really proud of personally. It was a half a million square feet and it included nine levels of patient care with four levels of underground parking and it brought up their campus to an additional 232 patient beds, which is a metric that we talk about in the, a lot in the healthcare world. 40 were critical care and it has a very elaborate complex bridge concourse system that basically interconnects all of their different clinics and the main hospital. And due to some of our sustainable efforts, we were able to achieve lead silver. This included a highly efficient central plant, um, a very efficient envelope. Actually, the entire um, facade is imported marble from Portugal, so it's not only really beautiful, but it's also very efficient, um, as well as the glazing. And we also did a lot of specialty lighting controls, and we did some condensate recovery that also contributed to its lead status. The plant itself was 2,400 ton to water plant with the ability and room for expansion, and it interconnects back into um, their existing plant, has the ability to. It also includes a high level of redundancy and resiliency um, with N plus one pumps and an entire N plus one chilled water system. Um, it does get all of its uh, steam from a campus loop that's used for sterilization and reheat. And it is one of the projects that we did use a 240 ton heat pump chiller, which again, it allows you to reduce your heating water hydraulic requirements um, because you're getting the free energy off of your chilled water system. Air handling units are strategically placed in penthouses and mechanical rooms throughout the building and um, that condensate is collected to then do condensate recovery, which is um, the main source or one of the main sources of makeup for the cooling tower. I we're really proud of having a really high delta T in this plant, um, both on the chilled water side and on the heating water side, which did allow for the facility to reach a lot of their energy goals. Now, back to Jason. He's going to talk to you about one of his projects, and we'll wrap it up with some Q&A. All right. Thanks, April. 
So uh, the project I'm going to walk through is what I would consider a fairly typical office building. While this one, located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, was for a company called Milwaukee Tool. Uh, we've probably seen the red packaging uh, in stores. Um, the, the project was very unique. It was over 150,000 square foot, four-story office building, exposed structure. So very, um, right there when you hear exposed structure, no ceilings, that means all the exciting HVAC stuff becomes visible. Um, we looked at a variety of HVAC system, uh, HVAC system options, including package rooftop units, indoor air handling units, chill water, DX, gas heat, hot water, um, all these different systems. Through energy modeling, uh, the discussions about space requirements, and then how to meet the very high priority aesthetic demands, which was the driving factor in most decisions on this project. Uh, the final system solution was a highly efficient and very quiet air-cooled chiller system that was located right out some offices on a um, lower roof of the building, um, a boiler plant that was in an N plus one arrangement, so there's a redundant boiler. Uh, that boiler plant is viewable on the main floor of the building. There's uh, large glass windows that, uh, that allow you to look in on this uh, boiler plant. And the indoor air handling units um, were used due to a restriction of a building height where the building envelope itself was built to the maximum height allowed in this location. Um, so equipment, needless to say, needed to be indoors. So uh, it was a very exciting project because all of the HVAC stuff was exposed, which doesn't happen very often for us. And at this point, I'll turn the presentation back over to Amara. All right, awesome. So now it's time for the question and answer portion. Please type your questions in the ask a question box on your screen, typing the presenter's name before your question so that I know who should answer it. We will get to as many questions as time allows. Responses to questions that we don't get to will be posted online at www.csemag.com in about a week. As a reminder, to download the presentation slides, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Also, you may earn one AIA CES approved learning unit for this event, and you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab on the left, uh, I'm sorry, on the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. So please open the browser tab now. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the archived version of this webcast. And before we get to the Q&A, we wanted to let you know about another option for continuing education if you need additional hours. On CFE EDU, an interactive educational platform, you can register for several different courses, such as data sender air handling units. Click on the link on the downloadable PDF to get to the CFE EDU course and for many more courses. All right, so April and Jason will now answer questions about this topic. And Jason, I'm gonna send the first question to you. Can you please outline the life cycle cost of owning and operating the HVAC systems you mentioned? So that's a very interesting question. The life cycle cost of an HVAC system is extremely important to be considered when we're selecting that system early in the design phase of the project. So life cycle cost will include everything from the energy used to component replacement to total system replacement. So all those factors need to be included. As HVAC engineers, we're not always really good at estimating uh, replacement costs or maintenance costs, uh, whether preventative or, or component replacement. Uh, but we need to keep all those things in mind. We need to use available sources such as contractors or other um, data sources that are available to help us with those costs. All those factors need to be considered when you're selecting your HVAC system because even if a system is a lower first cost, it could have a significant cost during the lifetime of that system and the building that it's serving. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, April, this next 
question is for you. And I think this is top of mind for many people. So let me get through a couple parts of this question and perhaps you can piece it all together. Uh, this is regarding COVID-19. So how have HVAC design considerations changed around COVID-19 and will post-pandemic conditions influence design parameters, especially with regard to comfort and energy efficiency? Can you address both of those, please? Absolutely, Amara, thank you. So I'm sure COVID-19 is on the top of pretty much everybody's mind that is here on this webcast, um, as it has been on our minds for many months now. And it is interesting to think about how this will change the design moving forward. So obviously as a, a healthcare engineer, um, we are already knowing of things that will change probably in incoming healthcare standards that will um, be just completely different ways of how we think of doing design. And a lot of that will be with um, controls and the ability to fully exhaust spaces that maybe we weren't fully exhausting before. Um, just due to providing more biocontainment areas um, for the hospital. But even beyond healthcare, we will see this change in all different types of buildings, um, schools and offices, everywhere that people come to congregate will probably be designed with different consideration. Um, obviously, there's some things that we already know that can be um, very effective against COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of articles and R&D that has been done around HEPA filtration as well as UV lights and different um, bipolar ionization project, pro products um, that can help with um, filtering the air prior to it getting back to, into a space. Um, obviously, if you're able to fully exhaust spaces, so that they do not recirculate back into your air handling unit system. That is a very effective way to make sure that you are getting rid of contaminated air, but that can hurt you on an energy efficiency standpoint, because rather than bringing that air, handling, bringing that air back to your air handling unit at a 75 degree temperature that you're only having to slightly cool as you mix with your outside air, you will have to introduce more outside air to maintain a positively pressurized building. So there are a lot of things that we have to consider. Um, in terms of thermal comfort, I don't think there'll be great impact to thermal comfort, but that is something that we will need to consider. Um, the first most important thing though will be how do we filter the air and how do we get contaminated air out of our spaces? All good points, thanks April. Uh, the next question, Jason, is for you, and this is going back to the codes and standards portion that you discussed. What happens when the code references the standard? I know there are certain sections in the International Mechanical Code that reference NFPA. Does that make NFPA standards the code, or how, how does that all work together? That's a great question. Uh, in the past, we've dealt with um, conflicts between NFPA and IMC, uh, such that municipalities or states have adopted NFPA and also adopted the um, IMC. So uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of the particular uh, instance where NFPA is referenced in IMC, uh, but when there are conflicts, it is important that uh, first the engineer evaluates what is that conflict and how important is that conflict. Uh, in preparation for a conversation with the authority having jurisdiction, the AHJ, uh, to get their interpretation. Because while codes are in con may, or while a code and a standard may be in conflict, um, the local municipality, the local inspector, the local AHJ, plan reviewer, whoever it might be, will have their own opinion on which way to go. And as the engineer, you'll have your own opinion on which way you think it's best served as well. So it's important to collect your information, do your research, bounce it off a coworker, and then be prepared to talk to the AHJ about the issue and, um, and resolve it to everyone's benefit. You need to make sure that you're watching out for uh, life safety issues. That's typically where, where these things will, will conflict. Uh, the reference I made was to location of smoke detectors that we all dealt with for many years. Um, while most of those things are being resolved now with adoption of very standard codes, such as the ICC codes, um, becoming uh, very commonplace, uh, most of those issues have gone away. 
All right, good. Thank you, Jason. And kind of keeping on the same topic, April, of codes and standards, the next question is for you. Which code or standard specifies the minimum air changes? Yes. All right, Amara, that's a great question. So um, in the healthcare world, um, we do use ASHRAE 170, which has been adopted by SGI. Um, so it is a standard that is now adopted as code. And that is um, basically our Bible for how we design healthcare facilities specific to the ventilation requirements within a hospital. So that does prescribe which minimum air changes we have to meet at all times within different spaces. However, there are codes out there um, that also deal with minimum air changes or minimum air flows that are required um, for all types of buildings. So within the INC, there is the ventilation section that will also describe what requirements are required in terms of airflow or CFM uh, for every single different space type. This also links back to standard ASHRAE 62.1. And these are the minimum airflows that are required um, by code that we have to be meeting of ventilation air in the space itself. So the quantity of outside air that we are required to bring into the space um, to make it safe for the occupants. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, Jason, a question for you. Does DDC, in other words, Direct Digital Controls, include use of Internet of Things, and is it useful for small to medium-sized buildings? That's another great question. We have lots of great questions today. So the Internet of Things, very, very hot topic over the past couple years. Uh, DDC systems, DDC becomes a reference that's somewhat generic, like when we reference facial tissues. We all use a very specific brand name sometimes when we reference facial tissues. That's how I look at DDC systems, where we say DDC, but it means a lot of things. It means that it can be a system that runs HVAC. It means a system that can pull in data from, uh, from random water or energy meters in a building, or it can control lighting. Um, all these things are getting into the Internet of Things, which is the interconnection of all these different systems together into a single interface and allowing a building to be a lot smarter. So the first step is always pulling in what you can into a building control system, whatever that building control system is by whatever manufacturer, and then using all that input to have your building react in a more energy efficient or provide a higher level of comfort for the occupant or have a, a more resilient building. All right, got it. All right, April, this last question goes to you. We only have time for one more question. What is a Delta T, uh, what Delta T was used for the Emory Hospital and why is that important? All right, another great question. Okay, so um, Delta T is um, a function of flow. So as you can increase the Delta T of a system, you are able to decrease the amount of flow your delta T relates to your entering and leaving water temperatures. And we were able to kind of push the limits on this project. We were able to achieve a 16 degree delta T on the chilled water system, which I'd say is fairly typical, somewhere between 14 to 18 um, in a hospital application. Um, but on the heating water side, we actually were able to achieve a 60 degree delta T, which is quite aggressive. Um, on a heating water loop. And so we were able to do that with an exterior and an interior loop design um, where we had the exterior at a delta of 30 degrees and the interior loop also at a delta of 30 degrees. That allowed our plants to have a lower incoming water temperature come back and so not as much energy had to be used with the boiler system. And it also made our heat pump chiller more efficient um, which allowed for increased energy efficiencies at the plant level. So thank you very much, Amara, for that question. All right. Well, thank you, April. And I'd like to close by thanking these wonderful subject matter experts, April Woods and Jason Gerke, 
for sharing their wide-ranging knowledge and for providing valuable examples of HVAC system design. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to the sponsor, Aegis, for supporting today's webcast. Now that the technical portion of this webcast is done, we want to hear from you. A short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a few seconds to complete it. We will use this information to improve future education. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology, thanks for attending this webcast. This is the end of today's event. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.